God has given us. Uh, this is something that uh, uh, God has placed in my heart. This, we are the construction and we are the main here. And the God is building, building the body. Amen? Amen? You know, and I think about it when I look at uh, some of the scriptures of the by implication, some I'll read. Uh, but it certainly will be on the video. We kind of moved the camera over so we can remove some of the static that was in there this morning tonight. A lot of uh, background. I think we uh, cleared that up. We also have a new camera. We're just trying to figure out how to use it. <laughs> and a new uh, projector. We're trying to figure out how to use it. But it's all worked out. And God is in control. Amen? Amen. Uh, it shows that He's the one that's in charge of everything, not us. We get so out of, play, out of whack sometimes. And is it really faith or is it we deal with facts? <laughs> and so, you know, Jesus mentioned something there in Luke, the 18th chapter, verse 8b, that I think is uh, something that should be a challenge to everyone, everyone listening uh, today to what God is sharing with us we should be concerned about. He said, nevertheless, when the Son of Man come, shall he find faith on the earth. And that, that always challenges me. There are some things that I read and some things I'm aware of. And it challenges me uh, because uh, I, I understand that wide is the way that, that road that leads to destruction, narrow is the way to lead to righteousness. And sometimes we take we take it for granted uh, that we are uh, that we are following the full will of God, and we just you know, the world church is just convinced us we can just make it in. But, uh, the just, the Bible says, should live by faith, and you can't live by faith unless you have the faith of Christ in your heart. Amen. So what does the uh, word faith mean? Now I'm going to use the Strong's Concordance to, uh, to define some areas from the Strong's Concordance. And we're going to spend some time shortly on our Bible studies on using the Concordance and, and moving from the Old Testament to the New and vice versa on some uh, scripture preparations for our prayer, for our Bible studies and so forth. And so Strong's is one of those that have been proven and tested at the time, it's not the only one. I also use uh, the Young's Concordance and, and others. Um, in the Strong's Concordance, it defines belief, faith as a belief, faithfulness, reliability, trust, confidence, firm persuasion, assurance, or firm conviction. And we talk about in our God. <laughs> We talk about in our God, not in ourselves, huh? I have no confidence in the flesh, none whatsoever. I only have confidence in, 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 in the resurrected power of Jesus Christ when he do me. That's it. Each of these definitions of faith are found and they are demonstrated in God's Word. And there are more. To me, I've studied for some time. There are more uh, implications and, and descriptions of faith carried out by men and women of God. Uh, uh, from the Old Testament to the New, and it's going on in the New Testament uh, epistles, you and I being the living epistles. <laughs> the question is, have all believers the faith that's written up in the Word of God? Have all believers been given faith? That should be clear, because in, in the uh, 12th chapter of Romans, we're going to begin reading verses 1, 2, 3, and it will prove that all of us have been given a measure of faith. And so the answer would be absolutely. How, how else could it be possible for you to walk in obedience to the commandments of God? And, uh, and we are going to Romans 12, but in Ephesians 3, 12, it says, Christ dwells in your hearts by faith. God is faith. God don't have to have faith, people. And, you know, that's a, we got a lot of doctrine out there, and we just added a lot of stuff to it because it sounds good. It's parallel to it. It looks right. But God is the creator. Uh, he is who he is. And so you can give him all kinds of extra titles. Uh, but the Bible does say God is love. And that love only uh, 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 is administered to us by faith. So we need to look at the implications, look how it is, and how people have, have uh, come up with these different uh, uh, terms. Uh, but that's not for today's message. But the message is today, every born again believer has been given a measure of faith. Now Romans 12, 1 through 3 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, mercy, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is a reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's all about the will. 
It's just the, the will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. So whether you are today, and you are listening to this teaching today, whether you are a, a new convert, uh, or you have been in the way, by the way, the, the way is one of the, the scriptures of who Christians are. Uh, 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 at, at Corinth, they, they were first called Christians, saints, the way. And so a lot of the scriptures to, to identify us, who we are people. Uh, we all soon begin to realize that it is by the mercies of God that we are able to present our bodies a living sacrifice, which is holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable uh, service. And that it is the measure of faith given to each of you that has strengthened you to be conformed, not to this world, but to be conformed unto God, and given you the ability to be transformed by the renewal of your, your mind, proving what is good, acceptable, and the perfect will of God. It's kind of like I'm reading back or praying back the scriptures to you. You see, in your obedience, the Lord has blessed you to build on the measure of faith given you. So no one in here today should be saying, I have no faith. <laughs> I have little faith. That should not be it. We ought to be excited by God is building our faith. Amen? We are on that building block that Jesus Christ is our building. Often when I think about faith, though, a faith in God, and I truly uh, thought about this before I made this, these notes. Um, and when I think about where my faith stands, in particular circumstances that I face, and we, did, we tend to face these circumstances daily, but some of them are major, and they may not come to court, or, but they come. Uh, I think about David. I think about David, that little ruddy teenager uh, that was taking care of his dad's sheep. And I just, I just think about David. I mean, you know, that boy had unconditional faith. And so I'm going to read a couple of verses in 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter, verse 33. And I'm going to read on down to 40. It's kind of like I'm not doing an overview of really what led up to it, but I will do it in a prepared summary or a synopsis of reading. I'm going to read to you in a moment. So let me just read this part of the first, if you don't mind, in 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter, verse 33. It says, And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and the youth being teenager. Right? And he is a man of war from his youth. And David said unto the king, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after him and spoke him, and delivered him out of his mouth. And when he arose, Against me, I caught him by his beard and spoke him and slew him. See, David had, and if I might add, and I'll try to be consistent with this message today because it's centered on faith. We have to understand the power of faith in this message. And because I, I have a tendency to do rabbit trails when I teach, and I understand that. That's fine. That's generally textual when it comes to deliverance. But we're talking about uh, the confrontation of the demon, and we're talking about receiving what God has given us faith. Amen? And, um, but David had something in him and that was being built up. I would use you, but I would say that I am a youth in, in the Lord. <laughs> I've always uh, got daddy telling me what to do. Uh, and so uh, David had facing options there as a sheep herder and, and the old man's dad's sheep while his brothers are out in the war. And he makes it, and he says, he talks about the, the lion and the bear and how they were smoked by God's power. Uh, and that uh, what he had conquered here, the lion and the bear. Uh, the lion speaks of pride, the most proud animal in, in the forest. And, and the bear speaks of the grip of religion, uh, the, the power of how man can be brought under subjection to it. And the lion was coming with a new religion. And he was speaking like the roar of a lion. Uh, and so God had, for such a time as this, and if you think about it, some of the battles you face, you know, they're behind us now. All right, but how much more are prepared are we getting so when the next battle comes so we can walk stronger in the faith of God? And sometimes we have to go back and remember those, those past experiences with God and make notes of it right now how uh, things happened and, and God saw it through. And I was facing this battle and, and God come up with a miracle. I had no idea somebody was going to come and give me my bill money. 
Sometimes we have to remind ourselves and testify to ourselves the goodness of our God. Amen? So David is testifying of the goodness of his God. Amen? And he's testifying to the king. Amen. And thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he had defied the armies of the living God. And David said, Lord, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he shall deliver me, and that's the grip, out of the hand of this Philistine. This religious uh, doctrine, this, this divine power working. And Saul said unto David, Go, the Lord be with thee. And Saul armed David with his armor, the king armor. Put, it, put a helmet on, his, a brass on his head, and also armor with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he ascended to go, but he couldn't, he couldn't prove it. It's, and David said to the king, I, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. I, 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 this is not what I use. This is not what God's giving me to fight with. And David put them off, and he took his staff and his hand and chose them five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in the shepherd bag which he had, even in a, a script. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. Now that is powerful. You know, what's in your bag? I mean, God's got, God's got those... God's got armor for us. He's got provision for us in our bag. We're going to cover a lot of that today in this, in this hour with the Lord. You know, when you think about uh, David, I want to, to read a prepared uh, uh, summary uh, of David's courage uh, and, and the faith of David that I prepared. And it, it goes like this. The biblical account of David and Goliath is one of the most popular stories in Scripture. It's one of the most popular with me. My favorite book is the book of Exodus. When God used Moses to part that seed, he blew me away. I said, man, you, man. The people went through hell and cried, man. I said, yeah, my God is powerful. He's awesome, you know. And, and, the, and the bad part about it, it was that the people that was not serving God, they were serving deities and demons, couldn't even see that. I would have told people, back off, we're going there. <laughs> That's how the devil is, just having you go out there and mess with done what you want to do, and then you have to come back over and up and you. Um, so God is so, so merciful. Amen? Amen? It is a lesson here of uh, courage, uh, faith, uh, and overcoming what seems impossible. David was the youngest of, of Jesse's 12 sons, and one day the nation of Israel was called to fight the Philistine army. They had gathered for war. And while David's brothers went to fight, Young David stayed back because he was over the, the, the uh, his, his dad's uh, uh, sheep and uh, as a shepherd. And the two armies gathered to stand on opposite sides in a very deep valley. And a great Philistine giant named Goliath that stood over nine feet tall came to the front of the Philistine battle line each day for 40 days. Uh, word uh, 40 speaks of um, uh, I'm going to give you this uh, when it comes back to me I'll give it maybe it's not, uh, maybe it's not for me to say right now um, and so for 40 days um, Goliath appeared here 40 days and mocked the Israelites and their God. God called to them, uh, excuse me, Goliath called to them to fight, but King Saul and the Israelites were scared and did nothing. David was sent by his dad Jesse to visit the front lines and bring back battle news from his brothers. He was sent there also with provisions, and, and this is what the families did. They brought provisions, food, and different things. There were so many people assigned to the regiments, and they had to be fed that way. It's not like our military is today. They have, have rations and have cafeterias and things like that. So David, while he was there, he heard uh, Goliath mocking Israel and their God. And David was brave, and he volunteered to fight Goliath. He persuaded the, uh, the Holy Spirit, persuaded King Saul, because Saul recognized faith manifested in the man he had been uh, had received the Holy Ghost 
and I saw King Saul at that time at, at, uh, in his walk, and that uh, he recognized the spirit rising up in David, and he let him go fight. He decided, uh, David decided not to wear any of King Saul's armor, and David carried a sling, he had five smooth uh, stones, and Goliath, when he saw him, laughed at him. Just ha 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 ha, he just laughed at him. But David responded that even though Goliath had a sword and a spear, a spear he came in, that David came in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel. David put a rock in his sling and swung one of the rocks at Goliath's head, and the rock sank into David's forehead and he fell. David then picked up Goliath's sword, used it to kill Goliath, and cut off his head. And that was powerful. That was supernatural. And you go back and do your studies and your readings in these chapters because it is an awesome story of courage and what God can do to, a, to an obedient soul to use us. And this is how he wants to use each of us today. This familiar Bible study reminds us of the courage in men's hearts when their faith is placed entirely in God. Goliath taunts David. But David's faith becomes evident when he does not call under the threats, but instead warns Goliath with the hand of God. The armor he rejects represents the strength of man. While David chose the armor of God, we must as well walk in the of David in the whole armor of God. The whole armor of God. God has provided the same assurance to each of you. He has provided that. We just need to have faith and trust in Him. God desires that each of you have faith and trust in Him no differently than David had. David had been tested. And when he saw this giant, and he also heard what this giant was saying, he also saw the Lord God as Israel's deliverer. He saw through the vision of faith in God. Therefore, the giant appeared to, to David as an ant. That's how it appeared to him. Trust, people. Trust God's word. For God will defend his own. God will, will take care of his own people. David was not proud, uh, but he was confident that his God would not take these insults and these threats against Israel like him. He was not afraid of mere man, of the situation he was in, the conditions of the battle, or the history of his adversary, faith in God was enough, five food, uh, food song, stones, and an attitude to serve. And we have to think about it in our own uh, descriptions of life, the things that we face, the giants that we face each day in our life, or, or, or our situations, or, or are we uh, adjusting with the, uh, the armor of men? And are we more concerned about the conditions, the history, uh, of the situations that we face? Or do we rewrite history by speaking the word of God over the places and the peoples and the things that we are confronted with each day? Certainly we all have had those great faith experiences though. Uh, I know I have, and I'm certain many of you have, and perhaps you face a few not so great faith days as well. I'm confident that you can have great faith in God daily. I'm very confident of that. Only if you have faith in God to believe. Only if you believe. Christians have experienced different levels of faith during their walk, measured by their trust in, in God. Do all have the same faith and trust in God? Well, today we're going to look at some examples, uh, of several types of examples of faith being demonstrated in the Word of God uh, by His disciples and others. And craftily, some of these examples will, will strengthen all of us. Amen? In Matthew, the 6th chapter, verse 28, where I'd I like to begin, uh, Jesus taught his disciples and followers to have faith in God and how to maintain their faith in God. In Matthew, the 6th chapter, verse 28, the Bible says, And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothes the grass in the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, 
Shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink? Where we also how will we clothe you? For after all these things do the, the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father, knowing that you have need of all these things. The reason why the word Gentile is used in this context is because Gentile means a nation without covenant. People without my covenant think this way. That's what he said here. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Wow, that is powerful. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And so every person has a need, including myself, for provisions and clothing and food jobs and, and, and more. We all have this have this uh, 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 need and, uh, uh, in the world. Uh, God has these provisions for you. Jesus has told us to take no thought about his divine supplies for us, not the world. He's going to take you his own. When we do not trust him for the divine supplies, it is a demonstration of little faith. Ooh. And Jesus tells us not to walk in little faith. In verse 30 says, for ye of little faith. This is based on just the bare necessities. I mean, not you haven't faced a lion or a double pigeon that jumped over a fence coming running down the street at you. Alright? This is just everyday XOXO, I guess that's the right term. LOL or something like that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, <laughs> and so, so how do we overcome? The Bible says, seek ye the kingdom of God. So little faith is conquered in our faith by what? The Bible said just simply seeking the kingdom of God first. Prioritize. All right? Seeking the kingdom of God. Now, I, I may want a certain item, but it has no spiritual significance, and it's just a choice. And I can ask God for it. I've seen God give me things that I didn't really deserve. Um, but sometimes we ask for things that are rabbit trails to lead us to hell. And then when God stops us from getting it, then we want to blame God. Or then we blame ourselves, like, way about not deserving. And then you realize six months later, come on TV, that that prophet has something in it, a key, or you know, whatever. It's not I don't know. I don't know. I'm just going to give an example here. Another example is found in, in Mark, the fourth chapter, verses uh, 35. Mark the fourth chapter, verse 35. Give me a moment to turn to that. And by the way, uh, uh, the 40 days speaks of tests and trials. Now, I knew it would come back to me, but I refused to jot it in my notes last night. I just said it would come back to me because I said, gotcha. <laughs> Amen? All right, so Mark the fourth chapter, verse 35 says, And the same day when the evening was come, he said unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him, even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the inner part of the ship asleep. Jesus was on a pillow. And they await him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? <laughs> and he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased. And that was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Mm. And they feared the sea and said to one another, What man of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? And so, as we examine this, there was this, uh, this incident where a great storm had arisen and Jesus was asleep in the ship physically. He wasn't asleep spiritually. And uh, I was witnessing to a gentleman yesterday. I said, Man, your soul ain't gonna be, it never sleeps, brother. I said, This thing ain't gonna live forever. I said, When well, we live here, we go directly into the presence of the Lord. I say, well, uh, Whoopi Goldberg had, 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 had it right. You gonna serve the devil and the ghost when the, when the person dies? The dark ages came to God. I say, I have this. Is, I have many more testimonies of people that died at the platform. Didn't know they were just preaching. Big churches in New York and different places, 
And they said, the angel came and patted that right there. That's a good sign to me. The angel come and give it. I ain't got no issue. And if anybody that's done deliverance and seen demons just speak out, people ought to know hell is real. So we got to keep that out of the church for sure. We don't want deliverance in the church. Because then the people are going to know the devil is real. Well, this was an incident of a great storm that had arisen and Jesus was asleep in the ship physically. And his disciples faced what many believers have faced during the storms of life that have come our way. Jesus rebuked the wind said to the raging sea, be still, peace be still. Jesus, in this particular teaching day, because everything he did was a teaching day. You've, uh, many times I'll say that at conferences and things like that, if I'm overseeing my wife and I'm overseeing it, I'll let them know that every moment is going to be a teaching moment, so don't expect me to be perfect. I'm going to allow some things to happen so you can discern. And um, so he used this teaching moment here, and he exposed their fears teaching them to have faith and to have power through him over nature that is being used by Satan to destroy man. Now I know God is a loving God and there's some scripture proof that he'll do things uh, because we ask him, uh, we're just trying to make sure this is who he is. And, uh, I, but I'm not real comfortable with asking God just to make it stop raining because I don't want to get in the rain. But if nature is raging storm and there's a hurricane, I rebuke it in the name of the Lord. In fact, we stand and agree with our brothers and sisters in the state of Florida. We rebuke it in the name of the Lord. We didn't stop in the name of Jesus. So I'm just kind of uncomfortable about those people that want to let you know I went outside and I stopped the rain. Well, if you did, just don't tell nobody else. That was just God's death for you. But you start telling out here, that means I got to preach it. You got to tell it. You got to tell it. Everybody should be saying we stopped the rain. You stopped the rain over the before we dropped. <laughs> I'm just telling the truth. Say the devil be set free. So this was a, a wind and a raging that Satan was involved in. So he rebuked it. He don't rebuke his creation. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Jesus said in here in this passage of scripture, it says, they had manifested no faith. Oh. No faith was manifested in his disciples during this context. So have there been any context that you and I have faced? Well, for that moment we exercised no context. I mean, that, for that moment in the contest, we exercise no faith. Hmm. Okay. So Jesus delivered them in all of the little ships that were being tossed to and fro by the rain, and they were the small ships that accompanied them in the sea. And the Bible makes it clear, none were lost. That's how powerful our God is. I mean, I mean, don't get no goosebumps, but we ought to be getting excited, you know, about trusting God. Live in Christ Jesus. He has power over nature. He has power over nature. In Matthew the 8th chapter, is another great uh, uh, example. It, it talks about great faith in here. So I know we want to go there. So Matthew the 8th chapter, um, verse 5 through 13. I'm going to read these passages of scripture to you. Very common uh, and familiar scriptures to all of us. Matthew the 8th chapter, verse 5, it says, and when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion officer, beseeching him, and saying, Lord, call him master, the word Lord. My servant lied at home sick of the palsy, grievously sick, tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Well, Lord, I thought worthy that I was going to come under my roof. But speak the word only, and my servant shall be here. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say unto this man, Go, and he goeth unto another company, coming unto my servant, do this, and he will. Understand, his delivery to Jesus is a calm, deliberate you, you, uh, 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 conversation in humility, talking to him in context. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them, that followed. Very, very, I say to you, I've not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. So great faith, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east, the west, and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So many, so many will not be able to see the loving God, trust God, and come in. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, 
And as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant will heal that very same, self same hour. And you need to go back and read the rest of that in, in the, the text because it, the whole thing just spin you off the spool. I mean, it put you on the powder wheel, but if you don't want to get off the spool, you want to stay on that wheel, you know, stay, and, and let God keep shaping because it's just a whole lot of meat there. And bread and some milk. I mean, it's a whole lot there for us to receive that. And so Jesus uh, uh, gave a definition here of great faith. Um, in verse 8, the, the centurion said, I'm not worried that you should come on the mountain. And so my point is, is that real authority has its foundation in total humility and faith and trust. Real authority. To fully understand authority, one must be under authority. The centurion understood this simple spiritual principle being a natural, physical, uh, national uh, centurion officer. And he didn't get there because they just called him up one day and said, now you're in charge of these 80 people. And he came up through the rank. Jesus said in, 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 the, uh, in verse 10 of this particular uh, chapter, Verily, verily, I say unto you, have, I have not found so great faith, not at all, not in Israel. He would not say that if it was there, but it was not that much. Or it was there. Well, Jesus wasn't a liar, people. So he said he hadn't found it. He hadn't found it at that point. All right? And how did this interior soldier obtain the great faith not yet manifested in all Israel? I'm going to sum it up like this. I'll call it. He understood. The, the faith he had was rooted in his understanding as a soldier and his submission to authority. A centurion officer of the Roman army commanded 83 men to fight, commonly soon 100. Later in time, they changed it to between 80 and 100 men, and some increased beyond that number. The faith and the understanding of authority that the centurion officer possessed was rooted in his understanding of submission to authority. The height, the depth, the width of your individual ministries will be determined by your ability to comprehend submission and like measure. Many Christians and many church leaders, regardless of their office, have not passed the spiritual tests of submission. submission. Many ministers and believers in today's modern church, the new modern church, would not qualify as disciples during Jesus' life on earth. They are too opinionated, proud and average, self-serving, and many have excuses refusing to serve. But God's got a people that have not bowed their knees to Baal. A people that say, yes, Lord, to your will. Amen? To each of you, as Christians and future leaders, another important part about authority that is often ignored is that delegating authority is representative and not inherent, which means it's not existing in somebody naturally. We ourselves do not have any authority. We are here, however, simply to represent and execute God's authority in the earth, the church, the home, and where possible, society itself. We are not born with this trait. It will be found in your submission to God. The real act of submission will cause you to lose your opinion. You just simply obey. Uh, RJ, is a, he don't say nothing. Uh, I go out there, I watch the games, and if you have children, I'll try to get to y'all. To me, the son, I can't help him. He wore number 19, he wore my number. And so all this kind of stuff, I keep, I keep up with everybody. And, um, but I, I remember I was out there a few weeks ago, and he was the leading person coming through the field. And he didn't have his head up there like he was high and mighty. He just let his head down, and he led the team out of the field, the first one out. And so, you know, he didn't get to be there because he was a great player when he started out. He probably was like the rest of us, didn't know God. And Daddy threw him that first ball. <laughs> so, I mean, y'all know how that go. Y'all know how it goes. That's how it happened with us, too. Now, we all in that, that cycle of growth, uh, understanding submission and authority. We all in that cycle, no matter what it is. And you, uh, young people, and certainly those that have gotten older in the Lord, because that's become, those can be very dangerous because you can get set in ways. Uh, and so you don't want to be set in ways. Um, and you want to be able to trust those that, that labor with you, trust those who are with you, and give them opportunity to, to grow. The Bible has a lot to say about how we respond to situations in our daily lives. Uh, do you respond with no faith, little faith, weak faith, or great faith? We each deal with various degrees of faith daily in our lives. Some have great faith for healing. 
uh, but little faith when it comes to driving after dark. So you must learn and practice facing your Goliaths and defeat them daily in your lives, fully conquering them, conquering them, building your faith and trust in the Lord. In any area where you compromise, the devil don't compromise. He become he becomes uh, the, the, the control of that area of your life. And so wherever you find uh, a, a real measure there, a doubt or some area of compromise or some giants you want to deal with, that should be the area that the Holy Spirit may be saying, this is what I'm driving. You say, well, no, I'm studying the prophetic. <laughs> or whatever. Or, or I'm studying deliverance. No. You got to have all that. The gifts, the call of uh, what I'm prepared is God giving you that. All right, so he's trying to tell you the measure that you will need in order to be proficient in those things. And so we, we ought to be on the, I mean, I got up this morning, I was mean, sleep last night, but one time I woke up and Lord put something on my heart. I had to write an email to a, to a soldier down in, in, uh, in, uh, in California, uh, ex-Marine, and uh, we were talking yesterday. I said, well, make sure we clear on what I was saying. So I had to get up this morning before I do my Bible sources and uh, while, while I was waiting on my coffee in the group, <laughs> and communicate. And so that giant, that little mold could have turned into a big old bean down the road. And the person don't understand. Well, you said so and so. So we must apply God's word to our entire walk, and not just the walk that's in front of other people to say. We gotta. We, we, I mean, people. We gotta go out here and face the world, and the, the world can read our mail greater than the church. And the reason why is that the church is not trying to judge the church. We have, God's given us a gift to be able to discern certain things in the world and handle that appropriately. And so, but we shouldn't be using the gift of discernment to say, I know Sister Tomisha don't like me. I can tell. I didn't know discernment. That's judgment. You got an issue. That's your issue. Am I saying something that makes sense? So, God is a, he's faithful. In, in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, everyone knows it by heart. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What we may not know about this scripture is that uh, there's a particular word here that has a description here. I'm going to read it like this. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is belief in God or in God's promises being fully persuaded. Fully persuaded. Fully per persuaded people. Fully persuaded. Have you ever went to God and said, I'm just not sure? Well, that's okay. It depends on what you're not sure about. You know, how the methodology, what he's trying to get you to do in that witness and how you preach and stuff like that. But just trusting him, you, you better stand back and say, Lord, I, I, I trust you. I have faith in my God. And you may need to say that to yourself until you believe it and get it down. Because faith comes about here and hear about a word. The word that you speak also. In the Lord. Amen? So the Greek word for faith in this particular verse is a word called pistos. P-I-S-T-O-S. And it, mean, it means, literally translated in the, in the Strong's, I believe on divine and truth. I believe on the word of God. And that's, really, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a verb. I mean, it's, it's active. Okay? And uh, we need to have that understanding, not just read that and then read the rest of the chapter talking about they had faith to do this and they, went, and they died over here and they did it. That's not what it's saying here. All right? When we think about it in the co conclusion of today's message, I just want to take a few examples uh, on how important faith is in your walk in Christ. So, I'm going to redo them, but you sh I suggest that you go back and look at the scriptures for those of you that are following along with the, the teaching today. In Ephesians, the second chapter, verse 8, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. You didn't save yourself. You what's I got water baptized. I joined such and such a church. No, it doesn't say that. It's not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. You were saved by grace. And the Bible says through faith. Uh-oh. How important is faith? <laughs> grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. Faith is a gift of God and the access to God's divine grace. Well, let's look at it more in, in Let's look at it in a different way. In Romans, the fifth chapter, we look at Romans, the fifth chapter, verses one and two, very common for the scriptures on faith. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace where we stand. 
and rejoice in hope and the glory of God. So we are justified by faith, and this faith from God also gives you, once again, access to God's grace. That's the devil that comes to try to make us think otherwise. I should not be pastor. I should not be uh, whatever I am in the titles. It doesn't really matter. I should not even be your brother that's speaking to you from the platform if I don't believe this. I mean, we all got some areas where we're learning how to believe more about because that's what we study daily. But we should have this resolve. I am saved by grace. You know, access to God. Faith is essential. In James, how about in the, in the healing chapter of James, the fifth chapter, verse 15, the Bible says that the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he committed any sins, they shall be forgiven him. So something is in the prayer of faith that deals with, and I didn't have time to cover all of those different aspects of forgiveness and so forth, but it's clearly indicated here that forgiveness is part of the prayer of faith when we're ministering for the sick. We are confessing our sins, our faults, confessing our judgments, our words. We are saying, God, I appeal before my great high priest and offer up before the repentance for my sins. I, and you call for the elders of the church. The Bible says you call for the elders of the church. In other words, ministry should have a, 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 people in the congregation and ministers should have an opportunity to be able to uh, ask for the elders for, the, for prayer and the laying of hands and the ministry uh, to the sick. That should be just XOXO. Uh, uh, XO. Uh, I guess I got it. Right. And so, uh, if you don't have that, then you need to have that. So, and you need to find a church, you find a church home, a place where you can be in a un fellowship where all of these traits are being taught today. Because we covered faith and we covered grace. But we also covered uh, uh, the grace of God working through our authority and submission uh, and fellowship. And now we're in the congregation. And now we're talking about getting prayer for the sick. You are healed by faith. Jesus Christ is the great physician. And faith is the essential element needed to access God's grace. Essential. If you have no faith, then how are you going to access God's grace? God is merciful. To the merciful, he becomes merciful. So that means there's a limit on the mercy if you live in God, mercy in your life working with others. If you're not versed with somebody, then don't go expect mercy from God. That's a scripture principle. We can go so many, where, so many different places with this teaching today. Uh, but do you see in each of these chapters that I covered today, Ephesians, Romans, and James, that all of them concluded with the access that God gives us access to God. It's, it's, it's faith in God. Faith from God gives us access to to God's grace in each of these uh, teachings here. <laughs> As we look at what we were, uh, the, the chapters that we cover today, the importance of faith to access God's grace, you've heard, you've read with me, faith is very important element. For we are saved by grace through faith, we are justified by faith, healed by faith, kept by faith, and what we didn't cover in Acts the, the second chapter of the day of Pentecost, baptized in the Spirit of God by faith. And there are many other essential elements and applications of faith in the Bible that God speaks about. And faith is an essential element needed to access God's grace. Okay, well, Pastor, I, I understand. And uh, I know this is necessary. So today we want to conclude the message with Four words. <laughs> Lord, increase our faith. Are we prepared to accept that though? Are we prepared to go through the lessons that his disciples must do? Who manifested little faith, weak faith, no faith, great faith? Are we prepared? So many, as soon as they face a situation, they abandon the ship. So it was easy uh, they, uh, to abandon the ship, but uh, it's kind of hard to abandon the ship in a hurricane. <laughs> <laughs> you gonna stay on hold on to that wood. Oh, that eye, you gonna stay on that ship. And you know, a simple four-word request to God. But it is a powerful request to our maker. Lord, increase our faith. You must read the word of God and you must believe 
Faith is increased in our lives by hearing and reading the Word of God in persistent prayer. Then you begin to put faith in your lives into action. In other words, the Word of God mixed with faith is profitable. The Word of God not mixed with faith is unprofitable. So let us repent today and let us allow the Lord of God the measure of faith that we need, the faith in our lives to be built upon, to grow, Lord, increase our faith. So Lord, I pray today, as we pray and join together in the unity of our faith, the unity of our spirit, Lord, Lord, increase our faith. Lord, we want to walk in the great faith of God, and we thank you for, for those faith and the, the word of God that you have placed in our heart, that we trust you, Lord God. Lord God, that we stand on your word, we stand and we have faith in you, Lord God, and access to you, Lord God, the grace of God in our lives. We repent, Father, in any area where we have not exhibited faith and we didn't deal with it, we let it pass. It was consumed later in our thoughts and we forgot about it. So we want to stand and give accountability today, God, for every area where we were uh, facing situations in our life and we addressed it with no faith, little faith, weak faith, and any other description of faith that was not the great faith of our God. For great is our God, and greatly to be praised. And Lord, we thank you today, Lord God, for you are forgiving God. We have bringing our petition for you, and we know that you are faithful and just. And forgive us, Lord God, of all iniquity. Lord God, as we present ourselves to you, our great high priest, Lord Jesus, the just shall live by faith. May God bless you, may God keep you.